Years ago, we had Dr. John Hanna from Dallas Theological Seminary come to our church. He's actually been here a number of times, and he had a favorite saying that he repeated quite often. I picked it up, and it annoys the, the crud out of my wife. It goes like this, life is hard, and then you die. You can see why she would be annoyed. <clears throat> Whether we call them lemons or curveballs or pitfalls, there is no shortage. There is no shortage. Not only did Dr. John Hanna know this to be true as he aged in life, but the Apostle Paul obviously knew this to be true as well. The Apostle Paul faced his share of lemons, curveballs, and pitfalls, did he not? He would go to his own people in the synagogues throughout Asia Minor in the first century of the Roman Empire, and he would just be so excited. He was so excited to go in and tell them about this Messiah he had found, this Yeshua Messiah who had saved him. And he loved his people and he prayed for them and he shed tears for them and he'd go into their synagogue, gatherings just like this where songs are lifted up in praise and the word of God is opened up and he would say, we have found the Messiah, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And just a handful would believe him, and then most of them would reject him and kick him out, and, and then the suffering would begin. Paul was beaten with rods. Paul was stoned. Paul was uh, shipwrecked. He had sleepless nights. Uh, he faced constant dangers and threats, both from without and stresses from within. Paul could certainly say there is a great element of truth to life is hard and then you die. And it is in the greatest chapter of the greatest book of the Bible. Toby, you knew we had to go here today, right? Psalms. No, not the Psalms. <laughs> Romans. So here's how we get to this place today, all right? This is how it works. The greatest testament is the New Testament. The greatest book in the New Testament is Romans. The greatest chapter in the greatest book is Romans chapter 8. And today we're going to be in the best part of Romans chapter 8. And in this section, Romans 8, 31 to 39, Paul writes to equip believers for their present sufferings, for the pitfalls, curveballs, and lemons of life. He writes to equip our minds and equip our souls to be able to deal with what's going to come down the pipe. And so if you'll turn into Romans chapter 8, there in the New Testament, in verse 31, Paul poses this question that will be our question today that we will be answering. He says, what then shall we say to these things? What then shall we Christians say, verbalize to these things? Well, that raises another question, doesn't it? What things? What things is he talking about? And so we, we need to at least go back to verse 18 of Romans chapter 8 so that we can get, get a feel for what Paul has in mind here in verse 31. Again, as he climaxes the greatest chapter, perhaps, in all of Holy Scripture. If we go back to verse 18, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And if we were to go on and read from there, we would see that what Paul has in mind when he says these things are these things. He means present sufferings because we're human and present sufferings because we're Christians. Sufferings like a groaning creation that has, uh, you know, snow, snowpocalypse and has hurricanes and has tornadoes that rip roofs off of perfectly sound houses and, 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 a, and a groaning creation that has a 100% mortality rate. Creation is groaning and we learn further that we are groaning. We as Christians are groaning. Our bodies are groaning. Our souls are groaning. We are homesick for heaven. And this is part of our suffering as Christians. We don't belong here. We're passing through. Our citizenship is in heaven. And so there is this inherent sadness for every Christian because we're not where we ultimately want to be. And so that's part of our suffering. What else is part of these things? Well, he talks about our weakness our weakness, and that's not knowing how to pray. I mean, who's been there? Who's had a situation of life where it just seemed insurmountable and seemed, I don't even know how to pray about this. And, and Paul acknowledges that that's part of our suffering. 
There's also the sufferings here in Romans 8. Listen, Christian, there's suffering to being a Christian. In other words, there's suffering when you have to put to death the deeds of your flesh. When your flesh screams to be pandered and comforted and served. This is part of the suffering of every Christian life. It's the suffering of repentance. It's the suffering of saying no to sin. It's the suffering of self-denial, of seeing something you really, really want badly in your flesh, and your flesh is screaming for it, and you have to say, no, because I'm on a different path of life. That's part of our suffering as well. That's part of the these things of verse 31. But this verse, not only does it look back to at least verse 18, it also looks forward. And we find a list in verse 35. Now, we're going to come back to this list in a few moments. But Paul rattles off here in rapid fire method seven different types of things that he has in mind. You see that in verse 35? He says, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword. And so when he's asking this question, what shall we say to these things? He has those things in mind as well. But I want to bring this home to Kerrville Bible Church. I, I want to bring this home as a, as a dose of reality here on Resurrection Sunday. Yes, we're praising our resurrected Savior, but we all walked into this room with problems, with trials, with these things. And so just a little dose of reality. If you, if, I'm not going to use any names. Some of them will be personal. Some of these will be church-wide, well-known in our church. If you hear of your example in the list that I'm going to go through here in a moment, that is because I have admired the way you have endured and had faith in our Lord through your trials. And again, this is a very abbreviated list. When you've been somewhere for 21 years, you know a lot of these things. <laughs> and so I abbreviate it for the sake of making the point. But what shall we say to the sudden loss of a loving husband, father, and grandfather while he's mowing his yard? And what should we say when a beloved mother languishes for six blessed and agonizing weeks in a hospital bed with hospice care? in her home, but she doesn't know she's in her home. What do we say to these things? What should we say when your best friend in the church and your best elder suddenly dies in his 50s? What shall we say when the doctor answers stage four? What shall we say when the doctor says, you need a heart transplant? What shall we say when your 21-year-old son, 20-year-old son, has two hip surgeries in one year, effectively ending any kind of college basketball? What shall we say when an engine part breaks off of an airliner, takes out a window, takes out a passenger, and you don't know if you're going to land and ever see your three daughters again? What shall we say when we sin that familiar sin? Or we sin in a way we never thought we were capable of. What shall we say when we become discouraged? And who hasn't? When we become depressed, even despairing of life. What shall we say when a grown daughter divorces her entire family with an email? What shall we say when our time on earth is up? You see, bad stuff happens to everyone up to and including death. But as believers here this morning, grounded in resurrection realities, grounded in resurrection realities, our response to bad stuff will be different from unbelievers. It will be different. It must be different. It should be different. Amen. <laughs> How can we be believers grounded in resurrection realities and then act just like unbelievers who do not believe that Jesus came out of that grave? See, that just cannot be the case. And Paul knows that it cannot be the case. So Paul knows two things. He knows that a Christian should always have hope because Jesus Christ came alive from the dead. And he knows that bad stuff happens to everybody, especially Christians. So how do I bring these two things together? Beginning in verse 31 is the pinnacle of his answer. The title of the sermon today is A Believer's Positive Response to Negative Stuff. A believer's positive response to negative stuff. Here's how it goes. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing, will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Are you convinced? I hope you will be by the time the sermon is over. Here's a believer's positive response to negative stuff. I want to show you four here using Paul's rhetorical questions in this passage. Four positive responses then to the bad stuff of life. Number one, is found in verse 31. If God is for us, who can stand against us? If God is for us, who is against us? It's a rhetorical question. Paul is saying, look, if you've got God Almighty on your side, you and God are a majority. <laughs> if you've got God on your side, you've got the omnipotent, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, eternal, infinitely glorious, powerful, good God on your side. And if that God is for you, who could possibly, possibly be against you? Now, in reality, there are people who are against us. And the list can be very long. But this is one of those deals where you say, relatively speaking, in comparison to who's on my side, ultimately, no one can be against us. And then he goes on to explain himself. He goes on and he shows us in what sense is God for us. In what sense is God for us? He who did not spare his own son... He who did not spare, did not keep, did not hold back his own son. It was actually his only son, his one and only son. And I just see that phrase and I say, this is inconceivable. We have two sons. I would hope as a Christian that I would, if, if, it, if it, the situation called for it, I would hope as a Christian that I would die for you. I would put myself in harm's way for you. But it is inconceivable to me to take one of my sons and put him in harm's way for you. I just can't get my mind around that. He who did not spare his own son, so God sent his son into the world, right? Not to judge the world, but to save the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He goes on, he says, how much is God for us? He delivered him over for us all. God did. God the Father delivered him up, gave him up for us all. That speaks very directly to the cross itself. That the cross itself, though carried out by sinful human beings, right? Though it was an act of murder, humanly speaking, it was the fulfillment of a predetermined plan of God from the divine perspective. God the Father gave up Christ on the cross as a sacrifice for sinners. And Paul says, for us all, he means all believers. The us there refers to Paul and the Christians he writes in Rome. How much is God for us? Well, he didn't hold back his son. In fact, he delivered him up to the cross to bear our sins, to take our penalty, to die our death for believers and so then he says, he, how will he not also with Jesus, so how will God the Father not also with Jesus freely give us Christians all things? So, so let me make sure you understand Paul's logic right here, okay? He is arguing from the greater to the lesser. Paul is saying, look, if God has already given us his one and only son, if God has already given us the most glorious, most valuable, most precious gift he could ever give to us, nothing can surpass Jesus, then he will give us all things behind that. 
It's like Jesus is this great engine car, you know, and then behind Jesus is, is railroad car after railroad car of all things. So before all is said and done for our human existence, God will give to every believer every good thing possible. Every good thing possible. He will freely do this for us because he's given the greatest gift of all. So again, negative stuff happens, bad stuff happens, and we stop and we step back and we say, if God is for us, who could be against us? One day I will not experience anything remotely like what I'm experiencing now. This is a lot like Psalm 27.1 where the psalmist said, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the defense of my life, whom shall I dread? Well, on the one hand, there are a lot of people we could fear and dread. But on the other hand, in light of God is my light, God is my salvation, God is my rescuer, ultimately then I can say, I fear no one because God is on my side. Let me illustrate this for you. This idea of God being for you, believer, being on your side in life, <laughs> it's like the sun always shining. So the, the sun shined all night last night, didn't it? And no matter how bad the storm is, no matter how dark the clouds are, no matter how much lightning and thunder is crashing in your life, the sun is still shining. And it keeps shining perfectly, blazing. And, and, and there's lots of ways to think about this illustration. The sun is like God's demeanor toward the believer. He's always smiling on you. He's always shining on you. He is always, always for you, on your side, not against you ever. God is never against you. He was against his own son on the cross so that he would not have to ever be against you. And then he raised him from the dead to say, when he said it is finished, I say amen. <laughs> I accept that sacrifice. And that's what he did when he raised him from the dead. So like the sun, it's always shining. Now if the sun stopped shining, we would all die physically. Right? It wouldn't take any time at all. We would all die. We would all perish. Or if the sun got too close... If it shined too hard on us, we couldn't bear it, right? We couldn't take it, and it would burn us up. And so that sun is just like God in our life. He doesn't get so close that he burns us up, and he doesn't drift away that we freeze to death. He's always shining, no matter what the circumstances are in our life. He is for us, not against us. Now, as you think about this sun shining in your life constantly, if you think about God being for you and not against you, and you think about this gift that he's already given, therefore every lesser gift will come behind it, you realize that from God's vantage point, there is nothing left to prove. He cannot make attempts to prove his love for you. Now, I, I, don't, I don't mean that he won't show you his love. He does that constantly. I mean that God can't try to prove his love to you because every attempt he would make falls short of what he's already done. You with me? So he's already done the greatest thing. So any other attempt that God would make to prove to you that he's for you and not against you would woefully fall short of the ultimate sacrifice and gift. And so when God says, you want your proof that I love you, you just go back to the cross and the empty tomb. And I can never, ever do something greater than that in your life. That's our anchor. All right, so let's make this practical for a moment. We have bad stuff. We have problems. Picture it this way. The problem sits right there in the middle of the room. No, it's not your husband in his recliner, okay? <laughs> but the problem, the problem sits there in the middle of the room. And the problem is huge, and the problem is ugly, and the problem is immovable, and it's very, very painful. It's, it's one of those kinds of problems that as soon as you talk about it, you start crying. It's just, it's just a weighty problem. But it sits there in the middle of the room. It's really in the middle of the path. And, and you must go through, you must go through this problem. You can't go over it. You can't go around it. You can't skip it. You can't just, you know, sleep, sleep for a while and it be gone. It's just going to be there. It's just there. God is not on the other side of the problem with you over here doing any number of things I guess he could be doing. He's not on the other side, you know, coaching you to get through the problem. You can do it. You know, have a stiff upper lip. <laughs> Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Just do it. I mean, God's not over there as this little cheerleader, this little coach trying to cheer us on to get through this insurmountable, painful problem. 
He's not over there either being sarcastic going, really, that's your plan? <laughs> you know, Jesus, did you see that? Did you see what he actually thought he's going to do with this problem? <laughs> he's not mocking us about the problem. He's like, huh, you're on your own. I'm going to say, this is going to be interesting. What are they going to do with this? He's not mocking. He's not sarcastic. He's not leaving it up to us. No, what he does is he comes around from that side of the problem to our side of the problem. He comes right beside us and he puts his arm around us. And he says, me and you together, we're going to go through this problem. I am for you. I am for you, God says. And we will do this together. Together. So again, we're answering a question, aren't we? What shall we say then? What shall we say then? So that's what we're going to do here this morning. We're going to say something together four times. So the first answer is there on the screen. Say it with me. What shall we say then? If God is for us, who is against us? One more time. If God is for us, who is against us? That's answer number one. Number two. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? The next rhetorical question in verse 33. Who will bring a charge? Oh, let's not put that up yet. Y'all didn't see that, right? You just, you didn't see that. We'll do that just at the end. Thank you. So who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies Okay, so you notice this passage is all about the bad things that happen to us. Okay, it starts with somebody being against us. And here it's, it involves charges. And then next it's going to involve condemnation. And then after that, separation. So all these things are negative things that potentially happen. And so Paul comes to the second rhetorical question. Who will bring a charge against whose elect? God's elect. Who will bring an accusation? Who will bring into the courtroom of God an accusation against a believer of their sin? Who will do that? And his answer to that question is, God is the one who justifies. So we need to break this down a little bit. Charge here has the idea of, a, of an accusation for sin that says you ought to be judged and condemned. God's elect is God's chosen people before the foundation of the world. God set his love on a people, and in time he saved them. They became the believers. And so Paul is asking, because he's already talked about these things in chapter 8, he's asking, who will do this? And then he says, God is the one who justifies. And that's the key word there, because justify is a declaration by a judge. It's an acquittal. So the defendant has come into a courtroom. The charges have been laid against the defendant. The evidence has been brought that shows that all of these charges are accurate and fair. And then God steps into that situation and he declares the guilty sinner righteous in his sight and forgives them of all of their sins. That's justification. It's not just as if you never sinned. It's better than that. It's God imputes the righteousness of Christ to your account and takes away all of your sins, past, present, and future, from his sight. This is what it means to be justified. Okay? So now when Paul says, who will bring a charge against God's elect, what he's basically saying is, exactly what court of appeal are you going to go into? Because the highest court in existence has already declared this person righteous. You're going to go to a, an appellate court? You're going to go to the Supreme Court? There is no court beyond the court of God. God is the one who's declared this person righteous. So this is awesome. And this is like Paul is in the courtroom and charges are being brought and Paul mocks them. He mocks the charges. He ridicules them because there's no court of appeal above God himself. Now, once again, just like there can be people against us, there can certainly be charges brought, right? Who brings charges against us? Satan. Satan. That's what his name means. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's constantly bringing charges against us before God. And then other people can slander us as Christians. Other people can bring charges against us. And probably worse than Satan and worse than other people is when your own heart brings charges against you. Right? When your own heart condemns you. Paul understands all of this, and he says whether it is Satan, whether it is other people and unbelievers, whether it is your own heart, believer, that is bringing the condemnation, 
God says to this, that cannot be heard in my courtroom. La, 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 I'm not listening. <laughs> you cannot bring that charge into this courtroom. It is barred. No access will be granted. It's not going to hear the case. I, mean, I love it. The Supreme Court does not have to hear a case. That you can bring a case to the Supreme Court and they can, they can just say, we're not listening to this. We're not going to get involved in this. We're not hearing this. And that's what God does with any charges against one of his elect. Listen, it's even better than that. Not even God will charge the believer with sin. He would have to go back on his own decision, wouldn't he? This judge does not make mistakes. This judge does not reverse his decisions in his courtroom. He has already decided at our justification, the moment we put our faith in Jesus Christ, God said, this one is righteous in my sight and all of their sins are forgiven forever. So you cannot do anything that, has to, that challenges their status in this court or their standing in my sight. Wow, Satan can't bring a charge that sticks that's what's that's that's what's meant here right it's a charge that sticks satan can't do it your own heart can't do it another sinner can't do it and god himself won't do it what shall we say then say it with me i'm forgiven and righteous because god says so what shall we say to these things? What shall we say to the negative stuff of life? This is what we say. I'm forgiven and righteous because God says so. That's justification. Glory be to the risen Christ. So, question number one, had God the Father in mind being for us and not against us? He's not a killjoy. He's not up there with a sledgehammer trying to smash us for every infraction of his, of his law. He's our heavenly Father. He's on our side. Question number two, still has God the Father in mind, the one who justifies us in his courtroom of perfect justice, the one who knew all of your sin the moment you put your faith in Christ, all of it, he knew all of it, and he declared you righteous and forgiven. God the Father, God the Father. Now as we come to verse 34, we shift our focus to God the Son, Jesus Christ. The rhetorical question number three is, who is the one who condemns? So it's not just a charge now, right? A charge is an accusation that you've got to go to court to answer for. Now it's the judgment. Now it's the condemnation. Now lock this person up, torture this person, kill this person, send this person to hell forever. It's the condemnation that comes as a result of our sin. And Paul says, who is the one who condemns? And then he gives us four quick responses that relate to the work of Christ. Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised. Number three, who is at the right hand of God. That's the ascension. Number four, who also intercedes for us. That's his intercession. So in quick fashion, Paul touches on the atonement at the cross, the resurrection at the empty tomb, the ascension 40 days later to God's right hand, and the present activity of Jesus Christ on your behalf, his intercession, intercessory ministry. So let me talk about Paul's logic here for a moment. He asked the question, who is the one who condemns? And his answer is, Christ Jesus is he who died. All right. Wait a minute. How, what, how, how does that line up? How does that connect? Here's how it connects. Here's the logic. Someone comes with a condemnation on your life, and Paul's answer is Christ Jesus died. In other words, Christ Jesus was condemned for that sin. Do we deserve to be condemned? Yes. But Christ Jesus died. Christ Jesus took our punishment. Christ Jesus took our condemnation. God poured out his wrath on his son. God abandoned him on the cross so that he would cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Okay. So here's Paul's logic. Since the son of God took the believer's condemnation that they deserve, therefore no one can come later and try to re-condemn them because it's already been taken out of the way. So there was atonement, and then there was resurrection. Yes, rather, who was raised, and then ascension, and then intercession. 
condemnation of a believer is impossible because, as 1 John 2, 1 says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Do we still sin as believers? Yes. Let me do that again so everyone can hear the answer. Do we still sin as believers? Yes. But we have an advocate with the Father. <laughs> Every time we sin, we have a defense attorney who's there in our place saying, that one's mine. That one belongs to me. <laughs> We're working on that. <laughs> our advocate, our intercessory before the Father. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You see, condemnation cannot happen to us because of Hebrews 7.25, which says, He, Jesus, saves to the uttermost since He always lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. <laughs> he always lives to make intercession. Some people live to play golf. Some people live to watch college basketball. Great game last night. Oh, my goodness. All-time classic. Some people live to eat. Some people live to shop. Jesus Christ lives to make intercession for you. That's what gets him up in the morning. <laughs> That's what energizes his life. He always lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through him. This is the present activity of Jesus right now. Dane Ortland talks about this in his wonderful little book, Gentle and Lowly. He says it this way, intercession is constantly hitting refresh of our justification in the court of heaven. Intercession of Jesus is constantly hitting refresh, refresh, refresh of our justification in the court of heaven. <laughs> Glory be to God. Condemnation is impossible of a believer because as Dane Ortland goes on to say, listen, we cannot sin our way out of his tender care. You can't do it. Not if you're in Christ. Not if you're a believer. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Can't happen. It's impossible. We can't sin our way out of his tender care. Condemnation cannot happen because when we stumble and when we fall, the crucified, risen, ascended Jesus is interceding for us. Or let's say it very simply, it cannot happen because Jesus is praying for you right now. And Jesus is praying for you right now. And five minutes from now, and five months from now, and five years from now, and forever from now, Jesus is praying for you right now. The righteous one is there lifting us up before the Father, hitting refresh on our justification. Glory be to God. What shall we say then to these things? Number three, united to Christ, I can never be condemned. I'll say it again. United to Christ, I can never be condemned. Someone will say, okay, preacher, I know all of this. I believe all of this. This is basic uh, Easter Sunday kind of stuff. This is basic gospel. But is there anything that will ever possibly cause God to stop loving me? Is there anything, anywhere, anyone can do that would cause God's heart to kind of, you know, mellow out toward me, kind of drift away from me, kind of say... Man, he just keeps doing the same stupid things, and I'm just really getting tired of this one, and I'm not sure I'm going to keep them or not. Is there anything that could ever challenge our security in God's sight? That brings us to question number four. Verse 35, Paul anticipates the believer thinking, is there something I could do? Is there something that could happen to me? Is there a trial so deep, so hard? so hard that my weak faith might step back and say, I'm not sure God still loves me. Verse 35 is the answer. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? I also love football in addition to basketball. And on defense, the other side has the ball. And the defense wants the ball. The object of defense is not just to keep them from scoring. It's to get the ball. <laughs> okay? And there's only one. And so the running back comes around the end with the football. And the object of the tackler is not only to tackle the running back, but is to 
separate him from the football. And this is a picture of what all of these obstacles and all of these negative things and Satan and all of his demons is trying to do to the Christian, trying to separate you from your faith, trying to separate, hit you so hard as you come around the corner with the faith of football that you are separated in your heart and in your mind from the love of Christ. And so Paul goes through a list of seven things, seven for the number of completion. He goes through a list of seven things as he tries to plumb the depths. Is there anything that could hit us so hard that we would then be separated from the love of Christ? Well, tribulation. Tribulation is affliction. It is pressure. That's what the word means, pressure. It's the idea of a general difficulty. So he says, first of all, will general difficulties and pressure separate you from the love of Christ? This would be like when you're going for a very important interview for a job that you really, really need and you get a flat tire. That's tribulation. That's pressure. The next word is distress. Will distress separate us from the love of Christ? This is the stress and the worry and the anxiety that comes from tribulation. So while you're on the side of the road missing your all-important interview and you're trying to fix that tire and you're starting to feel that stress and that worry and that anxiety, am I ever going to get a job and is God, is God against me and how am I going to pay the bills? That, that feeling that wells up within you is distress. Third thing he mentions is persecution. Now it's a very focused uh, tribulation and distress. This is where you are mocked for being a Christian, where your family disowns you for being a Christian. This is where you're ridiculed, where it's maybe verbal, maybe it's emotional. Persecution can be physical. In the first century, persecution to believers just like us, just Gentile believers like us, they would take these believers, they would dip them in tar, they would impale them on a stake, and set them on fire as their human torches. This is what happened to believers in the first century. Or if they were in a different mood that day, they may skin some goats, dress you in the fresh goat skins, and then throw you to the lions. This is how Christians were persecuted in the first century, right out of the gate of Christianity. Now we jump ahead to the 21st century, and Christians are persecuted by raiding Muslims who hack them up with machetes in various parts of the world. <laughs> or they're disowned by their family, depending on what kind of conversion experience they had and what they were saved out of. Or they're hacked up by words of other people, or they're locked up in jail like James Coates in Edmonton, Canada, for doing what we're doing right now. Persecution, can that separate us from the love of Christ? In other words, if a believer is being persecuted, the thought could enter into their mind, well, I wonder if God still loves me. Is this some kind of punishment for my sins? Why is this happening to me? He mentions a fourth one, famine. Famine, this would be the slow torture of malnutrition and weakness and sickness and dehydration. Famine, where things don't grow because there's drought and there's no food and you're starving to death. And yes, that can happen under the new covenant. Under the old covenant, if you were starving to death, that was a sign of God's cursing and that you've disobeyed God and, and God was punishing you. But we're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. And in the new covenant, a Christian can experience famine. And so the thought would be this, is starving to death a sign that Jesus no longer loves me? The next one is nakedness. Nakedness. Okay, this is not looking into your full closet on Easter morning and saying, I have nothing to wear. <laughs> this is looking around and saying, I don't have a closet. Nakedness. I mean, literally, you're not able to cover your body with clothing. Imagine being in that place, starving to death, exposed to the elements, persecuted, distressed, can all of that now combine, separate us from the love of Christ? Can it dislodge the football of faith from our hands? Well, let's go further. How about peril? Peril is a threat of danger, threat of loss, threat of death, threat of harm. Parents are, are used to this word because it shows up on these G and, and PG movies, you know, and it'll say, parents, uh, be warned of, in this movie, you know, like Frozen or some kind of cartoon movie, you know, of extreme peril. Right? Scenes of extreme peril. Life should come with such a warning, right? 
Scenes of extreme peril. And then finally, the seventh and final one is death itself. Sword. Sword. And, and this is not just any kind of death. This is a bloody, gruesome death. This is a painful death. This is a, a death possibly at the hands of government kind of death. And Paul is saying, is the slaughter of your government a sign of God's displeasure on your life? If you are offered up like a sheep to be slaughtered, like an innocent lamb, and, 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 and gruesomely killed even by the governing authorities... Should you ever entertain the thought that God is frowning on you? Should you ever entertain the thought that God is somehow displeased with you? Or should you ever entertain the thought that uh, God, God is, this is somehow punishment for my sin? And here's Paul's answer. But in all these things, all these things, we overwhelmingly, we don't just barely squeak through, we don't just barely survive, we overwhelmingly conquer, we're victorious through Him who, what? Loved us. Loved us. Not through him who is sovereign, not through him who is holy, not through him who is wise, not through him who is powerful, but through him who loved us. That's how we overwhelmingly conquer. And he goes on, and this really sounds like a lyric to a song, like a worship song. For I am convinced that neither death with its finality, nor life with its allurements, dangers, and trials, nor good angels, nor evil demons nor present sin or sufferings, nor the unpredictable things of life to come, nor spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, nor anything in the whole created the universe will be able to separate us, the believer, from the love of God, which is located in the heart of Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can possibly do this. Paul says that in these things and through these things and over all of these things, we soar to victory on the wings of Christ's love for us. This is why it's so very, very important that every believer gets deep down in your heart how much Christ loves you because that is the very pathway to the victory over these things. Paul says because of Christ's love, all of these things then are powerless to drive a wedge between you and God's love for you, between your soul and his heart for you. Again, he's come around on this side of the problem, and he said, I am for you. I will never condemn you. No one can bring a charge against you. So number four, the fourth thing that we shall say to all of these things, say it with me. We are loved forever because that's how Jesus loves. Let's go top to bottom. What shall we say then? If God is for us, who is against us? I'm forgiven and righteous because God says so. United to Christ, I can never be condemned. And we are loved forever because that's how Jesus loves. John Huss is a hero of mine. He lived in the 1300s and the early 1400s in Bohemia. That later became Czechoslovakia. John Huss is what's known as a pre-reformer. He lived and reformed or tried to reform even before Martin Luther and the famous reformers. Seeing the corruption in his day among the popes and the clergy, and he was one of the clergy, John Huss concluded that an unworthy pope ought not to be obeyed, that the Bible is the final authority, and that only God can grant forgiveness of sins, not the church. Of course, this did not set well with the Pope. And so John Huss was promptly excommunicated from the church. The Roman emperor, needing the Pope's support for political reasons, he ordered Huss to be silent. A council was called for him to defend his views. Upon arrival at the council, Huss was taken aside by the Pope himself and ordered to recant. He refused, and he was thrown in prison. Now, at first, the emperor protested that Huss had been thrown in prison, but when the emperor perceived that Huss was not popular with the people, he washed his hands of the whole mess, a la Pontius Pilate. On June 5th, 1415, John Huss was brought before the council. Recant, they demanded. He said, the accusations are false. And then he perceived that this was an unfair trial, and he shouted out in the midst of this trial, I appeal to Jesus Christ, the only judge who is almighty and completely just. 
In his hands I place my cause, since he will judge each, not on the basis of false witnesses and erring counsels, but on truth and justice. Back to prison <laughs> for John Huss. And then something very interesting happened. His own friends began to beg him to recant. His friends who loved him deeply saw how important he's going to be to this, this movement, wanting to preserve his life. They said, Brother John, the council wants to save face. They don't want to kill you. They just want you to recant to affirm their authority and then, and then you can go free. He refused to recant of the things he did not say for the sake of, of expediency. And he refused to recant of the things he did say that were true for the sake of conscience and truth. And so on June the 6th, the next day, in a ceremony of sorts, they ripped off his priestly garments. They shaved his head. And they put a paper crown on his head decorated with demons. John Huss was then marched outside of the building to be burned alive at the stake. On the way to the fire, he passed a pile of burning books, his books. They then tied him to the stake and they gave him one last chance to recant. Instead, he prayed this out loud. Lord Jesus... It is for you I patiently endure this cruel death. I ask you to have mercy on my enemies. As the flames engulfed him, he was heard singing praises to God. It was one of the Psalms. I have a feeling that John Huss spent some time in Romans chapter 8. <laughs> Father in heaven, we thank you for examples like John Huss. We thank you for examples like James Coates. And those even in these pews with us today, Lord. Examples of believers who have faced these things and have persevered, who have overwhelmingly conquered through him who loves them. So we bask today in the love of Christ, a love that we cannot ever lose because you are faithful. We thank you for this Resurrection Sunday 2021. And we pray that we would have packed churches praising Christ Sunday after Sunday until Jesus comes. We pray in his name. Amen.